Have you ever released your birds for a race, watch them circle the loft a few times, disappear into the sky and then never see them again? Not late, not tired, just gone. You check the traps every hour. You scan the sky for days. You ask other fanciers, nothing. And the worst part, you don't even know why. Was it the weather, bad training, a predator, or did they simply get lost? If this has happened to you, you're not alone. In fact, studies from National Racing Federation show that in average lofts, nearly 90% of young birds never complete their full race program. Most of them vanish on short to medium distance tosses, not because they're weak, but because they can't find their way home. And here's the hard truth. It's rarely just bad luck. Pigeons don't get lost randomly. They get lost when something disrupts the delicate systems they use to navigate, and most fanciers don't even know those systems exist. Today, I'm going to pull back the curtain on how racing pigeons really find their way home. Not the myths, not the old stories about homing instinct like it's magic, but the real science-backed truth backed by decades of research from universities like Oxford, Ghent, and the Max Planck Institute. And more importantly, I'll show you exactly what the top 1% of fanciers do differently to make sure their birds come home, race after race, year after year. Because the difference isn't in the birds, it's in how they're prepared. Let's start with this. Pigeons don't use one navigation system. They use three, and they work together like a high-tech cockpit. The first is the sun compass. Yes, pigeons track the position of the sun in the sky and use it like a giant clock to figure out direction. But here's what most people miss. They're not just looking at the sun, they're combining it with their internal sense of time. If their body clock is off, even by an hour, they'll fly in the wrong direction. That's why consistent loft routines matter so much. Same feeding time, same light exposure, same sleep schedule. Disrupt their rhythm and you disrupt their navigation. The second system is the Earth's magnetic field. Tiny iron-rich crystals in their beaks and possibly in their eyes act like a built-in compass. They literally feel the planet's magnetic lines. But this system is fragile. Power lines, cell towers, even underground mineral deposits can create magnetic noise that confuses them. That's why birds often get lost near cities, highways, or industrial zones. Not because they're weak, but because their compass is scrambled. And the third system? Landmarks and smell. Yes, smell. Research from the 1990s onward has shown that pigeons build a mental odor map of their home area. They learn the scent of rivers, forests, farms, even pollution, and use those smells like signposts. Young birds haven't built this map yet. That's why they get lost more often. They haven't flown enough to memorize the landscape. So when you toss a young bird 100 miles for the first time, it's like dropping someone in a foreign city with no GPS and saying, find your hotel. They might have the tools, but they haven't learned the streets. Now let's talk about the biggest mistake almost every fancier makes with young birds rushing their training. You see others racing their yearlings at 200 miles, so you think I should too. But if you haven't built their navigation map step by step, you're setting them up to vanish. The top lofts don't start with long tosses. They start with one mile, then two, then five, then ten. They let the bird fly, get lost for a few minutes, find its way back, and learn. Each flight builds confidence and memory. They don't just train the body. They train the brain, and they never skip a step. Another critical factor, loft location and setup. Your loft isn't just a home. It's the center of your bird's entire world map. If it's hard to see from the sky, if it's surrounded by tall trees, buildings, or looks like every other roof, your birds will struggle to recognize it on return. Champions place their lofts in open areas with a clear approach from the south, where most races come from. They paint the roof a unique color, red, white, blue, so it stands out. Some even add a small flag or windsock as a visual beacon. And inside the loft, consistency is everything. Same perch layout, same feeding spot, same water location. Birds use these cues to orient themselves the moment they land. Change the setup the week before a race, and you add confusion at the worst possible time. Now let's talk about weather, because it's not just about rain or wind. Solar activity plays a huge role. During strong solar flares, the Earth's magnetic field gets disturbed. Pigeons relying on their magnetic compass suddenly get false signals. National Racing Federations actually track solar activity and sometimes cancel races on high flare days. But most small fanciers don't know this. They release birds on a clear day, not realizing the sun is blasting invisible radiation that scrambles navigation. Always check space weather forecasts before race day. Sites like NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center are free and updated daily. In wind, it's not just about flying against it. Strong crosswinds can blow birds off course so far that their mental map no longer matches what they see below. That's why experienced fanciers watch not just wind speed, but wind direction over the entire race route, not just at the loft. If the wind is pushing birds toward a large city or mountain range they've never seen, the risk of loss skyrockets. 
Another hidden danger, stress. A stressed pigeon doesn't navigate well. Its brain is in survival mode, not mapping mode. Overcrowding, loud noises, predators near the loft, or even handling too much before a race. All these raise stress hormones that shut down higher brain functions. The top fanciers keep their lofts calm in the 48 hours before a race. No visitors, no cleaning, no changes, just quiet, routine, and peace. And they never race a bird that's molting, sick, or recovering from a hard flight. You might think one more race won't hurt, but a tired brain makes navigation errors. Now here's something personal. Five years ago, I lost three young cocks in one season, all on tosses under 150 miles. I was devastated. I checked everything, feed, health, loft, everything seemed fine. Then I realized I'd moved their perches the week before the first race. Small change, right? But to them, the home they'd memorized no longer looked the same from the sky. They circled, got confused, and gave up. After that, I never changed loft layout during racing season again. And my return rate jumped from 60% to over 95%. That's the power of understanding how they think, not just how they fly. So if you've lost birds, don't blame yourself. But do ask, did I give them the tools to find their way home? Did I build their map slowly? Did I keep their world consistent? Because navigation isn't magic. It's memory, biology, and preparation working together. And when you support all three, your birds don't just come home. They come home strong. Have you ever watched a pigeon circle your loft three times, dip its wings like it's about to land, and then suddenly pull up and fly away, never to return? That moment haunts every fancier. And the worst part isn't the loss itself. It's the not knowing. Was it my fault? Could I have prevented it? The truth is most losses aren't random. They're the result of small, invisible gaps in preparation. Gaps the top 1% of fanciers have learned to close. In the first part of this video, we talked about the three navigation systems pigeons use the sun compass, the magnetic sense, and the mental map built from landmarks and smells. Now let's go deeper into the exact step-by-step -step methods that turn confused birds into confident navigators. Because knowing how pigeons find home isn't enough. You have to know how to train that ability, protect it, and sharpen it like a blade. Let's start with young birds because this is where 90% of losses happen. Most fanciers treat young bird training like a checklist. Toss it 10 miles, then 25, then 50. But that's not training, that's testing. Real training is teaching, and teaching starts long before the first toss. It starts the day they fledge. From the moment a young pigeon leaves the nest, it begins memorizing the sky above its loft. It learns the angle of the sun at dawn, the direction of the wind, the shape of nearby trees, the sound of local traffic. This is its home image, a 360-degree mental snapshot it will use for the rest of its life. If you move the loft during this period, even just a few meters, you break that image. That's why the best fanciers never relocate lofts during breeding or early youth. They let the birds imprint on one fixed point, and they make that point unforgettable. Paint the roof a bright color, add a unique flag, place a white bucket on the roof edge. These aren't superstitions, they're visual beacons. Studies from the University of Zurich showed that pigeons released near lofts with high contrast visual markers return 22% faster than those with plain roofs. So ask yourself, from 500 feet in the air, does your loft stand out or blend in? Now let's talk about the training tosses themselves. The biggest mistake isn't distance, it's direction. Most fanciers release birds from the same direction over and over, south, because that's where races come from. But pigeons don't learn navigation in one direction. They need to build a full circle map. The top lofts train in all eight compass points, north, south, east, west, and the diagonals. They start with one-mile tosses in each direction, not all in one day over several weeks. Why? Because each direction teaches the bird a different part of the landscape. Flying north, it sees the river. Flying east, it smells the pine forest. Flying west, it hears the highway. These sensory inputs stitch together into a complete mental GPS. And if you only train south, your bird only knows half the map. Another critical detail, release time. Never release young birds after 10 a.m. Why? Because their sun compass depends on consistent light. Late releases mean the sun is too high, shadows are too short, and directional cues get fuzzy. The ideal window is 7 to 9 a.m. When the sun is low, shadows are long, and landmarks cast clear shapes on the ground. This gives the bird maximum visual information to match its mental map, and always release in good weather. No wind over 15 kilometers h. No rain. No overcast skies. Overcast is especially dangerous. It blocks the sun compass, forcing the bird to rely only on magnetic sense and landmarks. For a young bird with an incomplete map, that's like driving with one eye closed. Now what about the actual release? How you let them go matters more than you think. Never throw them into the air. Never chase them out of the basket. Open the door, step back, and let them decide when to fly. Rushing them creates panic. Panic shuts down navigation. Calm birds think, stressed birds flee. 
Then fleeing isn't flying home, it's flying away from danger. Give them 30 seconds to orient. Watch how they circle. If they fly straight up and vanish, they're confident. If they circle endlessly or fly low and erratic, they're confused. Bring them back. Don't force the toss. Better to skip one training than lose a bird forever. Now let's talk about something almost no one prepares for. Magnetic anomalies. The Earth's magnetic field isn't smooth. It has bumps, dips, and dead zones, especially near power lines, railways, cell towers, and even certain rock formations. In Belgium, there's a famous black zone near a high-voltage corridor where return rates drop by 40%. Birds aren't weak, they're disoriented. Their internal compass spins like a broken dial. So before you plan any toss, study your route. Use free tools like Google Earth and overlay powerline maps. Many national grid operators publish them. Avoid flying directly over substations, wind farms, or large metal structures. Even your own loft matters. Don't build it on a steel frame. Don't place metal waters right under perches. Small magnetic disturbances add up. And during solar storms, yes, they happen more often than you think. Postpone the race. The NOAA Space Weather Scale is free online. If its KP index is 5 or higher, the magnetic field is too unstable. Champions check this like they check the rain forecast. Now let's address the myth of bloodlines. Yes, some families have better homing instincts, but instinct without training is just potential. I've seen birds from unknown lofts outperform famous lines because they're fancier trained them right, and I've seen champion bloodlines vanish on their first toss because they were rushed. Genetics load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So don't worship pedigrees, worship preparation. Another hidden factor, hydration and gut health. A dehydrated pigeon's brain doesn't function well. Navigation requires sharp cognition, and cognition needs water. Always offer fresh, clean water the night before a toss. Add electrolytes if it's hot, and never race a bird with loose droppings. Gut inflammation sends stress signals to the brain, dulling focus. Probiotics two days before a race aren't just for recovery, they're for clarity. Now let's talk about the return flight. Many fanciers think the race ends when the bird lands, but the real test is what happens in the last 10 miles. This is where fatigue, confusion, and distraction hit hardest. A tired bird might see a similar-looking loft and land there by mistake. Or it might circle your loft but not recognize the entrance. That's why the top lofts make the trap unmistakable. They use bright-colored trapdoors. Red, yellow, white. They keep the area around the loft clear of clutter. No hanging laundry. No new furniture. No visitors standing near the entrance. And they train birds to enter fast. How? By making the inside irresistible. Fresh water. Favorite feed, a calm, dark interior. Birds learn home, safety plus reward. So they don't hesitate, they dive in. Now what about older birds? Do they ever get lost? Yes, but for different reasons. Older birds have strong maps, but their senses fade. Their eyesight dims. Their magnetic receptors weaken. That's why veteran fanciers adjust for age. They shorten race distances. They avoid extreme weather. They give extra recovery time. And they watch for signs of confusion. Slow circling. Landing on wrong roofs. Hesitation at the trap. These aren't failures. They're signals. Listen to them. Now let's talk about technology. GPS trackers have changed everything. For under $100, you can see exactly where your bird went and where it got lost. One fancier in the Netherlands discovered his birds were circling a wind farm 30 miles from home, completely disoriented. He changed his release direction and his return rate doubled. You don't need to track every bird, but tracking a few young ones teaches you your local danger zones and it shows you if your training is working. Did the bird fly straight, or did it zigzag, backtrack, get lost? Data doesn't lie. Another tool, flight simulators. Some top lofts use virtual reality setups where birds watch moving landscapes while on a tiny treadmill. It sounds sci-fi, but it builds mental maps faster. You don't need that, but you can simulate it. Show young birds photos of local landmarks. Play recordings of local sounds. The more sensory input they get, the richer their map becomes. Now let's address emotional stress. Because pigeons feel it more than we think. A bird that sees a hawk attack the loft will be nervous for weeks. A bird that's handled roughly before a race will fly with fear, not focus. The best fanciers are calm, quiet, and predictable. They speak softly. They move slowly. They never shout near the loft. And they never race a bird that's been bullied by others in the flock. Social stress is real. Isolate aggressive birds. Give shy birds safe perches. A peaceful loft is a smart loft. Now what about diet during navigation training? It's not just about energy, it's about brain fuel. Omega-3 fatty acids from flaxseed or fish oil support neural health. B vitamins from brewer's yeast boost nerve signaling. Antioxidants from greens reduce brain inflammation. Feed for the mind, not just the muscles. And never overfeed before a toss. A full crop weighs them down and diverts blood to digestion, not navigation. Light meal the night before. 
almost nothing the morning of. Now let's talk about group versus solo releases. Young birds should always be released in small groups. Three to five birds, why? Because they learn from each other. One confident bird can lead the rest home, but never release a young bird with older, faster racers. The young one will get left behind, panic, and give up. Match birds by age, speed, and experience. And never mix birds from different lofts in the same basket. Unfamiliar scents cause stress. Now what if a bird does get lost? Don't assume it's gone forever. Many birds return days or even weeks later. Exhausted, thin, but alive. Always keep the loft open. Always offer food and water. And never give up hope. I once had a hen return after 11 days. 300 miles off course. She'd been blown into a storm, landed in a forest, and slowly worked her way back using rivers and roads. She raced again the next season and placed top 10. Never underestimate their will to come home. Now let's talk about federation races. The biggest mistake fanciers make is treating every race the same. A 100-mile race on a calm spring day is nothing like a 300-mile race into headwinds in July. Adjust your preparation accordingly. For short races, focus on speed and trap response. For long races, focus on endurance, hydration, and mental stamina. And always study the release point. Is it near a large city? A mountain range? A lake? Each terrain creates different challenges. Lakes reflect sunlight, confusing the sun compass. Mountains block wind cues. Cities create magnetic noise. Know your route like a pilot knows his flight path. Now let's address a hard truth. Some losses are unavoidable. Hawks, storms, power lines, hunters, these are risks we can't control. But the majority of losses, they're preventable. They happen because we skip steps, rush training, ignore weather, or assume it'll be fine. The top 1% don't assume. They prepare, they observe, they adapt, and they never stop learning. I've been racing pigeons for 18 years. I've lost birds I loved. I've made every mistake you can imagine. But each loss taught me something. And slowly my return rate climbed from 50 to 95%. Not because I bought better birds, but because I finally learned to think like them, to see the world through their eyes, to respect the miracle of their navigation and protect it with everything I've got. So if you've lost birds, don't quit. Learn, adjust, try again. Because every pigeon wants to come home. They just need you to give them the tools, the training and the trust to find their way. And when they do, when you see that flash of color in the sky, that confident dive toward the trap, you'll know it wasn't luck. It was preparation, it was care, it was partnership. And that's what makes this sport so beautiful. If this helped you, please hit like. It tells YouTube this matters. Share it with a fancier who's lost birds and needs hope. And in the comments, tell me what's one thing you'll change in your training routine this week. I read every comment and I answer as many as I can. Until next time, keep your lofts calm, your maps clear, and your birds flying home.